कैमरा रिकॉर्डिंग तो बंद है ना हाँ ठीक है बाबा रिकॉर्डिंग चल रही है Uh, my name is Dandan and I work here as a talent acquisition. So just to give you a quick introduction about Equal Experts, we are a UK-based software development company, and uh, you know we, we we have a group called Expert Talks. As I, I can see, the frequent visitors as well. Right? Uh, we have conducted lots of meetups, uh, Expert Talks, annual conference, a technical conference last year, and uh, now today again we are. We have chosen one of the topics uh, of Java 9, right? And uh, so today's uh, expert talk is will be presented by Christian on Java 9's uh, features. And to just to update you about, uh, we have now uh, recently started our office in Bangalore as well. So you can probably expect some of the expert talks from Bangalore office soon. So I'll just hand it over to Christian. So we can start. It's interesting to see such a large crowd for this topic where it reflects the state of our industry which means that Java is basically the bread and butter language of our industry. Yeah, there's also discussions and going on like people saying that Clojure is better than Java or JavaScript is the new thing and all these things. And yes, all these other languages, they have lots of interesting features that can make the life of a developer easier but the majority of code written today is Java code, which makes it the most relevant language as of today for practical use. And one of the reasons is because a lot of people know Java and the choices that we make as consultants working for clients cannot always be that we make a choice of the very best programming language or the very best solution from a technical perspective, but as good consultants, we of course have to take other things into account as well, which can be things like maintainability, that does not only include whether the code is written nicely and in a maintainable way, but it also includes whether the client will be able to continue the project. Do they have the staff with the knowledge to work on it? If I just say closure is the best thing and I write a closure project and the client only has Java developers, they're going to have a hard time maintaining it. Ideally, of course, we would be flexible as developers and say the programming language doesn't matter. Even more ideally, we would have only one language. Like, for example, math. There's only one language in maths. There's not different dialects or different languages and then for different problems in maths, you use a different language Plus always means plus. Minus always means minus. So math is pretty well defined. In computer science, that's not the case. Time will tell why it is not the case. Currently, we can definitely revert back to the position and say that our industry or our profession compared to other professions is quite a young profession. In maths is something we are doing since thousands of years. Maybe not as sophisticated as today, but the roots are very old. Whereas computer science is something very young. The roots date back maybe to Adam Lovelace, Charles Babbage, the real hardcore stuff that came with people like Alan Turing, Conrad Zuse. That's pretty young. That's less than 100 years ago compared to other sciences that's really very, very young. So one reason why we have multiple languages could be that we're just not yet mature enough as an industry. The mic is on. That's as good as it gets. Um, the, so one reason could be that our industry is so young and we are still not evolved enough to have come up with one uniform language to express every problem that we could possibly have in computer science. Another reason could be that our domain in which we are working as computer scientists is just too vast and complex in all, so that it prevents of coming up with just a single language. Time will tell. I don't know. I hope 
it's the maturity of our industry. I wish we in some aspects would gather, gain the same maturity as we managed to gain in maths or physics. Uh, but maybe I'm a dreamer and it's not possible. The fact is Java is the bread and butter language of today. So let's look into the next version. It's going to be released soon. I came up with the idea for giving this topic as a talk about like four or five weeks ago. And I thought I can tell you the date when it's going to be published, and I thought I'm going to tell you the features that are going to be published. But there was a lot of things going on in the last few weeks in the Java community process, which has put the release of Java 9 under jeopardy, or at least of some of the features. And I'm also going to talk about that and why and what's the background. So, but let's first dive into a few topics that you already warmed up with Java 9. One of the new features that's introduced in Java 9 is the JShell. From many other programming languages, we've seen how useful it can be if you have an interpreter environment with a problem. We can just enter a line of code and run it and see what happens. In Java, that was not available. In Java, if you wanted to run a line of code, you always had to put it in the context of a Java source code file, compile it, and then run it. And as we all know, in Java, if you write a Java source code file for one line of code, you will have at least four other lines around it, a class, and the main method. And possibly, depending on what you do, you must be in a package. So maybe even a package statement, and then also probably import statements. Yeah, if you're doing something useful, then it's probably not going to be Hello World, so you're probably going to use classes from some other packages than Java Lang. With Java 9, we finally get a REPL, so a read, evaluate, print loop environment, as we might know from other languages like Clojure, Lisp, JavaScript. The idea of a REPL is actually very old. When I started computing in 1984 on an Amstrad CPC. The operating system was a basic operating system, not in the sense of very primitive, but in the sense of basic as a programming language being the interface. So you would type basic commands, and it was a REPL. You just type the basic command, press enter, and the command was executed. So the idea of a REPL is nothing new. But in the past, it had been seen as a typical attribute of interpreted languages. And Java is a compiler language. C is a compiler language. You also don't have a battle for C. And one of the things we've come to know in the recent, actually two decades, I would say, and Java had a major contribution to that, is that we have to blur the lines between interpreted languages and compiler languages. Java, actually it dates back much more than Java. Smalltalk already blurred that line long before Java, and also Pascal blurred that line long before Java, with a proper Pascal compiler that's written according to how Pascal is specified, would first translate the source code in what is called P code in Pascal, which is like a Java bytecode. It's not machine language for a real CPU. It's machine language for a virtual CPU, similar to the Java bytecode, which is the machine language of the Java virtual machine. And um, that already started blurring the line. In Java 1.0, you would translate your Java source code to a class file with Java bytecode, and the Java bytecode was interpreted by virtual machine. Today, if you run Java code and you run serious stuff on a server, it's not going to be interpreted. Maybe your boot up code is interpreted, but the code that runs at runtime and it's repeated multiple times will be just in time compiled into a real machine language. That's the perspective from a compiler language, that we mix interpreters for bytecode into the language to reduce translation time, and then compile at runtime to speed up the runtime, 
that's something that we also have now inserted into interpreter languages. If you run JavaScript in Chrome, that's no longer interpreted. It's compiled into machine language at runtime. That's why JavaScript is so fast today. If you compare JavaScript today with JavaScript like 10 years ago, no comparison at all. JavaScript is now competing with Java regarding performance on the server. No JS. Something like that would be unthinkable 10 years ago. Which is a nice improvement. But it meant that as Java developers, you might have been mocked in the recent one or two years by developers that do Clojure or Ruby or so and saying, you, you can't even run a single line of code without having to do so and so much in order to get it run. Now it can be as easy as that. And I'll also give you a live demo of the repo. Is it big enough so that everyone can read it? Okay. So you just run the J shell like this, and then you get the command prompt. And now you can type Java code. Just lines of Java code, like the classic. And then they're immediately executed. You can also put imports. and then use them. That's quite comfortable to just try out some stuff on the command line quickly. And how to exit, slash exit. Who knows how to exit the VI editor? Hands up. Wow, good ration. Good ration. <laughs> The Stack Overflow article for quitting the VI editor recently reached a read count of more than one million. <laughs> Which means that it really is a frequent topic. Next thing that was introduced is private interface methods. Interfaces in Java are getting more and more powerful as a language feature. So, um, what was introduced in Java 8, or was it Java 7, I don't remember precisely, were the default methods, which means that if you would specify an interface and you had like three or four methods, or for a few of them, you could say in 80% of the use cases, you'd always want this one implementation. Before the default methods, you were always restricted to write an abstract class for that use case, and then you're restricted to single inheritance. Whereas for interfaces in Java, multiple inheritance is allowed. And now interfaces in Java got something more on top of it. You can now also put private methods in interfaces. This is code that would not compile in Java 8 and 4, but it now compiles in Java 9. Because if it, and it's actually a logical consequence. When I learned about the default methods, one of the first things was I put a private method because I had two default methods using the same code, so I wanted to extract it into a method, and it didn't work. I had to make it another public default method, but I didn't want to expose it. And so that problem is solved. And what you can also do that is, um, I think that came with Java 8, or also Java 7, I don't remember exactly, you can put static methods in interfaces, it's just a reminder. So this interface with a main method inside works. Any questions on that? Simple but useful. Now we come to the hot topic of Java 9. That should have been the biggest thing about Java 9 and it's currently the hottest discussion about Java 9. And the reason why the release date and what actually is going to be in Java 9 are jeopardized. It's about Project Jigsaw. What does Project Jigsaw mean? If you can, um, if you look at the word Jigsaw, it's a metaphor for cutting something into pieces. 
And that's what Jigsaw also is about. It's about cutting the API and the JDK into pieces to address certain problems. One of the problems that Java wants to address is downscaling. Java is not only interesting on the desktop, actually it's no longer that interesting on the desktop. The majority of applications today on the desktop is not really written in Java. It's written for the browser. So whatever Java wanted to deliver as platform independence, today it's not delivered by Java, it's delivered by HTML5 and CSS and JavaScript. It's only like developer tools that are written in Java. Huh? Who uses IntelliJ IDEA or something like that, or Eclipse, hands up? Uh, everyone. So we use stuff that's written in Java. Which reminds me of an interesting um, discussion as a side note. Recently someone told me that C would be completely irrelevant. But he was working on a MacBook, running a kernel written in C, with a bash written in C, in a terminal written in C, and the next command he typed was ls, that is also written in C. Yeah. Um, it's quite easy if you're working in a niche, if that niche is very big, to think it's the only world that exists. But system development still exists. People write drivers for Linux and stuff. And that's also part of our industry. So Jigsaw wants to make the JDK smaller, in multiple ways. It wants to make the tools leaner so that when you only use parts of the features of a tool that it loads faster. It also wants to address another problem. If you look at the power of what you can do with Java because of all the API that's already provided in the Java 2 standard edition, but also if you look at all the additional features that you see from third-party libraries, Java is extremely powerful. But there's a certain type of applications that people are reluctant to develop in Java, and that's little small utilities for the command line. What's the reason why people are reluctant to do that in Java? It's the virtual machine startup type. If you look at the C compiler, and you look at traditional C development, where you then would maybe have like 500 or 1,000 source files in um, your project and you have a nicely written make file to compile that, it means that the C compiler has to be run 500 or 1000 times for your project and you run that make file and the compilation, if the make file is written properly, would on a decent developer laptop take like 5 to 10 seconds. In these 5 to 10 seconds you've started 500 to 1000 processes. It only works because these processes are relatively lightweight. If you start a Java virtual machine, that's not a lightweight process. That's a problem that Jigsaw wants to address. So it's about making the Java 2 standard edition platform more easily scaled down to small computing devices, but also to enable improved application performance on our devices benefit comes from the same downscale. Also, other aspects are addressed, like um, if you have a nice module system, then it's easier to build bigger applications. One of the strengths of languages like Java is, for example, namespacing, that we already have packages, and that we have a nice library system with um, Maven. Maven is a rubbish tool, in my opinion, but the idea of having dependency management made that easy is awesome. And um, that's something where we found out we can actually do more. Because currently in Java, if you look at all the versions up to Java 8, you would be making in a larger library things public that you actually don't want the user to use. Why do you still make them public? You spread your library across multiple packages and in order to call a method from one package, from another package, it has to be public. That's how the visibility is defined in Java. But that doesn't mean that it's actually part of your API. And one of the things that Jigsaw introduces is basically a fifth visibility level in Java. 
the four levels that you have right now is private, package default, protected, and public. And you get a fifth level on top of that, which you could call in layman's term the API level. And that is for security and maintainability, because people keep on calling com.sun and sun.something classes, although Oracle and before that Sun have repeatedly said, this is our private stuff, we're going to change it, don't use it. Yeah, only call java.something. People keep on using this private stuff, and that leads to situations like you're using Spring, and then you update JDK, and bang, Spring stops working. Why does Spring stop working? Because they use private stuff. They use undocumented features in all these things. So let's look into details. We get a new type of file for Java. This is called the module info.java file. And we get a small change to the directory structure, which is new elements in the directory structure, mods and emblem. Mods is where you would store what is now called the modules, which is basically like a library but it's intentionally not called library, it's called module, because a um, library is just one special case of a module. Now, if you have a microservice and you uh, layer your microservice and then you have, um, let's say, a DAO and a service and a repository, then you would want to maybe make three modules. We get new keywords in the Java language, but they are specific to the module info, the Java file. And I'm going to show you some examples around that. So you see in this directory we have a make file. Um, why do I use a make file? A, a make file is much simpler. B, you can see firsthand how the command line works, because if you to use a tool like Maven or so, everything is hidden from you. Yet another reason is Maven doesn't support Java 9 properly yet. So you cannot yet build a nice project in Maven with, um, that uses Java 9. The source directory structure is different from what you've seen before. Because this is what changes when you use the Java 9 module system. In the source directory, the first subdirectory uh, sub level that you see, it looks like a package name, but it's actually the module name. Because the default convention is to follow a same, the same naming convention for modules as for packages, which means you reverse the order of the elements of your company's or organization's domain name and use that as a base name for your package or in this case module. And then below that, this is your top level of the directory structure, which means if your package name and your module name are identical, you have a little bit of repetition. And let's look at the files. First, let's look at the file that it's easy, because that's just what you expect. That's our head of world in Java should look like. And that's the new file, the module info. And it declares that you have a module named com.hello. And because our module is very simple, there's nothing else to declare, so you just have an empty block. In more complex modules, this is where details about the modules will go. We'll also look at examples for that. The compilation requires that you create a mods directory, and in the mods directory, you create a subdirectory with the name of the module, just as you had in the source directory, and then you call the Java compiler. And how you call the Java compiler, if you use the modules, 
is the same as if you wouldn't use the modules. At least if it's as simple as that. You just use minus D to specify the destination directory. And then you specify all the source files that you want to have compiled. So if we now look what is in the modules directory, you see the hello.java class. The hello .java has been compiled into hello class, And you see the module info file has also been compiled. Also, it's not a typical class, but it means that um, from a language perspective, yeah, what uh, total level constructs we have that produce class files, and we have classes, interfaces, annotations, which are special interfaces, enums, which are special classes, and now we have yet another type in that system, that's the module. Any questions about this example? So what does this uh, uh, the package name and the module name similarity, similarity between the package name and the module name adds? What does the value does it add? Um, the idea is that so, I mean, hello is a good example to show the basics, but it's a bad example also because it's not the complexity of a real life project. So just use your imagination of a real life project that you've done you will certainly not have a single package. You will have multiple packages. However bad or good your package structure is, but usually you have multiple packages. You will not want 100 or 200 classes to be all in the same package. Yeah, you want cohesion. Yeah, you want that cohesive things, things that change together, are co-located. They are in the same place. And you want that things that do not change together are dislocated. They are in different places. So that you have um, cognitive resonance, no cognitive distance when you're looking for files in a project tree or in a file explorer or something like that. So you will usually have multiple packages. And um, so the redundancy comes from, this is really the module name, you have one module, and then below that you might have multiple packages. Can we have some modules in there? Um, there is no concept of a sub-module in the module concept. Um, a module is an element of its own, but um, you can simulate what you would expect from sub-modules with the features that I'm going to show next. So you can make modules that depend on other modules and require them. So that's a, that's a good question. I mean, first of all, in general, it's a good question, but it also helps um, addressing what you've said uh, or asked before. Um, packages are a hierarchical structure. A package can have a sub-package. A module cannot have a sub-module. Here, we have two modules. We have a world module, which, as you probably are already guessing, is going to provide the string world for the hello world message. And we have a combat hello module, which, as you can probably also guess, is the same module as before, just that it doesn't provide the world string itself. It's going to ask the other module for providing that string. First, look at the simple parts. We have the world class providing the world string in a static method, which then is called from the hello class in the main method to form the hello world message. So now we have one module that depends on another module. Now let's look at the module files. The org.world module 
now contains a new statement that you probably haven't seen before, unless if you've already been curious about Jigsaw. It's this line, exports org.world. So here in module, org.world, that's the module name, whereas here exports org.world is the package name. And this is what establishes this new fifth level of visibility. If you use the module system, depending on with which flags you start your virtual machine, code will be restricted to only call methods from other modules which are public and in a package that has been exported. That's the new key thing about preventing access to methods which have been made public because you've made some packages but should actually not be exposed to other parts of your system. Now with the module system you can actually do that and enforce that. And this is the counterpart. This declares the module called hello and it declares that it requires the module of the world. Is it mandatory to have a file name as module info? Yes. So the file module info is hardwired. It has to be module info Java. Otherwise, the Java compiler will not find the file or not recognize that this file is a module description. <coughs> it's like package info of Java, which was also the fixed file for Java doc in order to contain the documentation for a package. Now you have no option to use a different name than package info. Can you again open that hello.java? Uh, so I see you have made uh, hello as an enum. Is there a specific reason for it? Uh, yes. Um, because it's not a Java 9 question, may I answer the question a little bit later at the end of the talk? Is that sure. okay for you? Yeah. Okay, thank you. But it's a good question, it's an interesting topic, so I definitely want to answer the question. I just don't want to deviate for all the audience that expects Java 9 topics. Okay, sure. Any other questions on this? Just a follow-up question, so we can, instead of enum, we can have class as well. You could have used the class, but you will see why I use the enum once um, I answer the question. If I, in case I forget, I might, yeah, confuse professor. Um, forget about this, remind me. I want to answer the question. Okay. Christian? Yeah? Uh, what's the default behavior uh, if we don't use the exports? Uh, that, um, that's a question I haven't asked myself. Okay. Yeah. But we can try out. Okay. Yeah, let's just try it out. So let's compile and run this. So now you, you see the commands that are used. So I create the two module directories and the mods directory. And now you see new options for the Java compiler, which were newly introduced for Java 9. We have the module path option, which tells that mods is the directory containing the modules. And yeah, that, that's the new option. which is important for Java C to understand if it's looking for modules, which part of the path is the module name and which part of the path is the directory. So typically the Java options about directory structures work. And um, of course because of the dependency sequence, I first have to compile the world module and then the hello module because hello depends on the world. So, ah, I forgot a run rule. Why do I not have a run rule in this? Yeah, 
book. There's something wrong with my RAM duplex. Uh, I spot the error. Does anyone else spot the error? I probably have a wrong packet statement in my source code. It's expected to be convert hello, but it's convert world. <laughs> That's a mistake. And there we go. Now you see we had a world text. Now we can try out what um, you've just asked as the question. What happens if I don't export? So we just comment out the exports statement. Build it again. And there we have the answer. Yes, the default is that it's not exported, even if you have only one package. So this is the error message you get if it's not exported. And a similar question would be, what if I forget the requires? That also says it's not visible. So you need both things. The package needs to be exported, and if it's coming from another module, it needs to be required. Both things must be there. If one of them is missing, the package is not visible. Yeah? So how does it handle circular dependency? Like, if there are two modules, A is requiring B, and B is requiring A. So how can we compile um, That's a good question. I don't know how the module system reacts in circular dependencies. It's a question that usually I don't ask myself because I try, I always avoid circular dependencies because they sooner or later lead to hell. And um, as, a, as a side note, um, how many of you have heard of the solid principles? Quite a number. How many are they? The answer five might not be correct. The, um, of course, I also ask the question in a slightly tricky way, but um, I like to say that actually there are 11 solid principles, because I think it's easier to remember. Because what does solid principles actually say? It says it's the first five principles. If it's the first five principles, there must be more. And the total number of principles that was described in Robert C. Martin's paper, in which he describes the solid principles, are actually 11. And there are principles for class design, which are the solid principles, and there are principles for package design. There are six of them, and one of them is the ADP, the acyclic dependency principle. And in order to remind people of the fact that the package principles are there as well, and if you're working on a serious project, the package principles are as important as the class design principles, I tend to tell people that there's actually 11 solid principles. 
if you want to be nitpicking, you can say, you know, the solid principles are the five for the class design, and then there's also the six for the package design, and together they are the principles of object-oriented class and package design, if you want to be nitpicking. But I see the risk that with the popularity of the word solid, that too many people forget about the package principles. But um, we're going to look into that thing with the um, cyclic dependencies and we're going to look how it behaves. The way I compile it currently would not allow for circular dependencies. Because if I change the sequence in which I compile, it will not compile. Yeah, my make file has been taught with a dependency rule that Combot Hello as a module depends on ordered world as a module. It's part of my make file. So there is this um, this line tells make that before I try to generate the Combot Hello module, I first have to generate the ordered world module. Yeah, I'm not going to go into detail because this talk is not about make. just want to show you that I have something done in my make file in order to make sure that first it compiles order world, then it compiles combat hello. So that the dependency tree is built up from the bottom to the top. And we can just um, run the commands manually and put them in the wrong sequence. And you see, it says the other package that I need doesn't exist yet. And I think that was pretty much expected. So if you compile packages, uh, if you compile modules separately, you have no chance of introducing circular dependencies. If you compile from scratch. If you don't compile from scratch, they can sneak in in hideous ways. Um, I don't know how the module system reacts. Um, but let's for a moment assume the module system would also be fine with circular dependencies. We're going to check whether it's actually fine or not. Then what you would have to do is, you would have to compile both modules at the same time. And that's possible. I don't know if the reason why that's possible is actually to solve circular dependency problems. We're going to find out about that. But I actually think it probably is. And the reason why I suspect it is, the Java SDK is full of circular dependencies on a package level. Now, for example, you have Java Lang, and everything depends on Java Lang. But then in Java Lang, you have iterable as an interface, and what does iterable as an interface provide you? It provides an iterator. And in which package is iterator? From Java util. So there is a circular dependency between Java lang and Java util. And in which package do you find the class system? In Java lang. What does the class system contain? Besides other things, variables like out, error, in. Of what types are those? Print streams and input stream. These are in Java IO. So there's a circular dependency between Java Lang and Java IO. And Java IO provides serializer. And that's everywhere. So there's definitely also lost of circular dependencies between Java IO and other packages. And the same will be true for Java Util. So how do you deal with that in the module system? I think the only chance you have to deal with that is you support circular dependencies. Because while I try to avoid circular dependencies always in normal projects, when you provide the foundation of something as fundamental as the Java 2 standard edition API, it will be impossible to avoid circular dependencies. If it were possible, Sun would have certainly made an attempt because that circular dependencies are a problem is known not just since like 10 years. It's known since very, very long. So next thing I'm going to show you is how to compile two modules in one go. So 
if we look at the module structure, there's no change here. It's the same code as before, which means possibly with the same error as before. So let's fix that first. And um, now you see that I'm compiling all the world things and compile hello things in one go. So I can invoke the compiler in a way to compile multiple modules with a single invocation. That works. We have a new option, module source path. That is where the module tree starts in the source directory and where should the modules be stored. The output in the mods directory looks identical to the separate compilation, but um, there are multiple reasons why you might want to do this. One of them, we already said, is there might be asynchronous dependencies, and I would put a batch on that um, the modern system probably supports asynchronous dependencies, but we're going to try that. Uh, we don't want to tell you speculations, I want to tell you facts. And um, the other thing might be speed. Java compiler is a fast compiler, but it is a Java program, so it has a startup time. Therefore, you might want in a big project to speed it up by compiling multiple modules in one go. Now let's see what happens if we change the module descriptions to have a bidirectional dependency. So now both module descriptions require each other. So compot hello exports compot hello but requires all the world and all the world exports all the world but requires compot hello. And let's see what happens. Okay, my bet was wrong, but you have the fact the module system does not like executive dependencies. So that's prevented. Is it a good thing? Yes, it's a good thing. But I would be interested in knowing how the Java 2 Style Edition API is cut into modules if cyclic dependencies are not allowed. That is an interesting question. Just feel not answerable in the talk. Um, when, when we look at the examples we had before, what we've compiled is we've compiled into class files. For a real-world project, this is usually not how we distribute our modules or libraries. In a real-world project, how we distribute our modules or libraries in Java would actually be as jar files. So how does the module system interact with jar files? How does it work in case of jar files? That's the next example. So the code here is still the same, but the commands I'm going to execute are different. So you see that in the directories, we have one new directory here, mlib, which stands for module libraries. And you see that I'm calling the Java C command as before for compiling a single module. And then I'm running the jar command in order to pack the class files into a jar archive. And the jar command has learned something new that it didn't know before, which is versioning of jars. And you can see how I gave the module version here as what would be your first version as a semantic version with 
to like Jenkins setup or so. You should call it snapshot. The other versions were there before. So create is just C, file is just F, it's just what is your um, Java file. But you also see the convention how the version number goes into the file name. The convention is that you have the module name as the base name, then the at the rate symbol, and then the version number, and then the suffix dot Java. That's the convention. And in order to run it, it's actually very convenient. You just specify the mlib directory, which contains all the modules, and you say which module you want to run. How does it know if I just tell the module to run, which class it should run? The module is a jar file. And the jar file has a main class, which has ended up in the manifest in the jar file. Any questions on that so far? There's a little bit more to say, but uh, I want to keep it for the end of the talk to make sure that we don't run over time the essentials are going to be presented. And there's something else which I want to show. That's Java community process reaction to the module system, to Jigsaw. How many of the Java community process members have voted with yes? That's 10. How many of them have voted with no? That's 13. The acceptance of Jigsaw in the Java community process is not very high. Before we look into that, um, I have a question for you. With whatever background you have, whatever you have seen right now from the module system, did you like it or did you not so much like it? What's your opinion? Who liked it, what you've seen? Hands up, please. Who didn't like it, hands up. And um, who is neutral, hands up. The vast majority. It was a very important question to find out if anyone has fallen asleep. Actually, a large group of people <laughs> has fallen asleep because there were so few hands on whether you like it or whether you don't like it. And it's, of course, completely fine having seen something for the first time to have no opinion on it yet. Yeah? You have to play around with it and so on. Um, I have a question for those who said you would like it. Why do you like it? What do you like about it? Anyone? It's not a trick question. I'm not going to try your wrong. I'll tell you you're wrong. I'm not on any of the sides of the Java community process. Yeah. So. Um, I'm rather neutral on this. Does anyone want to say why you like it? Yeah? Uh, we will get a performance benefits with the modularity. Yeah, performance benefits. Of course, it's something you want to like. Yeah. I agree with that completely. And actually, whatever I've seen, I, I, I also like it. Yeah, that doesn't mean I'm on any of the sides, but what I've seen, I like it. So now it would be interesting to hear from those who said you don't like it, why you were not liking it. Yeah? Because the support for Madden is not available. And the second thing, uh, already the modularity is already available in the package. You can have a, uh, whatever we can achieve through models, you can have it through um, jar files as well. And those things, I don't see much difference because anyway we are going to have a jar uh, for uh, repository, jar for controller, jar for uh, services. Okay. So um, that already takes care of uh, modularity. Thank you very much. Um, on the Maven, I th Maven is going to support this. Yeah. It's just a matter of time. Java 9 is not released yet. And the Maven support will come. On the other aspect, thank you very much for bringing this up, because it means that 
I should have explained a certain aspect more in detail, which is the new visibility mechanism of packages. Um, Let's make an example which is not a very good example because simple things are just not really very realistic. So whatever complexity you want to bring in a simple example to show a real world thing actually looks a bit idiotic in the context of a little example. Like it looks a bit idiotic to get the string of Hello World from another place. But um, so forgive the example, it's simplicity, it tries to get the point across about something else. And let's increase the complexity and say our format method is something you also get from somewhere else. And let's say we get it from another package in our current module that we don't want to expose. Now actually, we are not using that. So let's actually go to the um, other class. Let's say this class doesn't get the world string from itself. It gets the world string from yet another class that it doesn't want to expose. And which, for reasons of the project, has to be in another package. Let's call the package secret to get the point across that you might have multiple packages in a module and some of these packages you don't want to expose as part of your callable API. questions on this piece of code? So we have a class world provider, which we have in the package org.world.secret. The class must be public because within the same module I have multiple packages and I want to use it from another package. So the Java syntax requires it's public. But I do not want anyone outside this module to have access on get girl. I want this to be secret. That's why I called it secret. And let's first check whether everything works fine. Yes, it does. And now let's change the source code of hello to attempt access to the secret class. And we see package of the word of secret is not visible. And that is the mechanism that you don't get from the packages. And I'm sorry that I had to prove your point wrong, because I would like to hear points from people why the module system is not good. Because these tick boxes, they have to come from somewhere. So does anyone have more points why you don't like it that haven't been mentioned before? Can a, can a package belong to only one box? Um, that's a good <coughs> question that I again didn't ask myself. Like, I wouldn't make a cyclic dependency. I wouldn't put the same package name in two different modules. 
so I haven't asked myself that question. Um, we can try. Try just. Um, In com.hello, also make an org.world package. So this is the error message from before, you can ignore this. This is the error message that answers your question. So I've now tried to put the orchid world package in the orchid world module and in the convert hello module. And the error message I get is package exists in another module. So if I'm depending on another module and I'm trying to declare a package that's already present in the other module, the compiler prevents it get this error message. So I cannot use the same package name in two modules that are used together. And I think, to me, that makes sense. So in this case, if, I, if there are multiple packages, now of course this is a very simplistic example, but if you, if you have like, like 50 packages or 20 packages or something, mm -hmm. and you want to achieve modules by different permutations and combinations of different packages, uh, would that scenario be possible using... Uh, um, I'm trying to understand your situation with the permutations. Um, I think I would not have a situation where I want the same package to appear physically in multiple modules. But I would then put the package that I... Because why would I want to do that? Because I want to reuse it. But this reuse already comes from the module system itself. So if I want to have the same package being used in multiple places, I would put this package in a module and use it from the other modules that need the same package. Right, but in that case, uh, you're going to have a very defined and rigid uh, dependency. So it's not necessarily defined and rigid in all aspects. Um, the providing module knows nothing about the requiring module. That's a very important thing about the dependency management in general. We see it everywhere, like for example, a superclass. Normally, there might be special exceptions and very particular design patterns, but normally a superclass, for example, knows nothing about its subclasses. That is part of the reusability of a superclass or a, a, a collection class like this, it knows nothing about the content types. It's decoupled by not knowing it. And similar, a module does not know its users. The user knows the module that is being used. But I think he's trying to ask something like, can I link to a module can I, can I use it in a dynamical way? So maybe the contract is same, but I can I choose the implementation of something? That is possible. Yeah, that is possible. So that's part of what I said. Um, I will move at the end of the talk. Um, that's part of the users provides with. Yeah. So there's more mechanisms in the module system that I haven't shown yet, which address what before that was um, provided as a mechanism with the service provider in the API. With the service provider in the API, you could define an interface for a framework and then you could provide an implementation with a specific file structure in the manifest directory and meta directory where you would provide the class names of the implementation of the interface and then you could ask the service loader to give you these class names and instantiate them and they would then again give you some information like for example which cryptographic algorithms does this cryptography implementation support? Do you support RSA? Do you support DSA? And so on. This mechanism
can now, or at least aspects of this mechanism, can now also be done in the audio system in a more declarative way. So, um, with users, you can make what you could call a framework module, which says, I use a specific interface. That interface is part of your module, but the implementation is not. And then, with provides, with you specify the interface that you're providing in your framework implementation module, and with with, you provide the class name that implements that interface. That's how you do frameworks with the... They just the need system. to be on the class path. Uh, just exactly, then it just needs to be on the class path in order to be used. How much of your question is answered with that? Yeah, so what I was trying to understand is if, if I have multiple packages, modules would be looking at modules as a logical grouping of those packages which could be uh, exposed, uh, maybe? Um, I think maybe, let's also talk about um, when would you group your packages into modules and when would you not do that? So for example, if I'm writing a microservice, I don't think I would make a separate module for the DAO and a separate module for the service, for example. I could, don't see why I would do that in a microservice. But um, if I have a microservice which I not only use as a standalone microservice, but at the same time I also want to use this microservice as a component. So that I have another service, maybe a microservice, it's slightly bigger, or maybe not a microservice, maybe a monolith, where I want to use the same features, so I need the DAO and the service, then I might make this microservice, the basic microservice, a module, and then in the module I would say I expose the service, but I don't expose the DAO. Now, because if you allow others to access the DAO directly, you might get problems with data consistency. That's why you make a service around the DAO. The service, one of the responsibilities is data consistency. To make sure that the translation between view and backend model functions correctly. So you want that if someone uses your microservice not by calling the REST endpoints, but by linking as a jar file directly with your microservice jar or one that you only can use, they only can use the service, but not the DAO. So you put the, make it a module, you expose the package that contains the service, but you don't expose the package that contains the DAO. Does that help you better understanding it? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, back to the Java community process. Why there are people that don't like it? And let's see who likes it and who doesn't like it. That's an information for which I don't have a slide, I'm just telling you. Those who like it are those who do not yet have created a module system of their own. And those who don't like it are those who have created something like a module system for Java. And those who are big shots in the OSGI, for example, don't like it. Because they see that if Jigsaw comes, a lot of their efforts would have been in vain. Because whatever module system they have created before, has become pretty useless. And um, that's one of the criticisms about this. I do not know whether I shall agree or disagree with that criticism, because there's things on both sides of this. Um, one aspect is, if you create a module system, why do you do it without the Java community process in the first place? and then complain if the Java community process creates a module system and say, now I don't like it. That's why I think the point is partly pointless. On the other hand, I know 
how tedious and difficult it can be to deal with Oracle. It was already sometimes difficult with Sun. It has become much more difficult with Oracle. I personally am slightly pissed by Oracle because of the way how they deal with the community. Yeah. When Java 7 was released, Java 6 was released, Java 5 was released, I looked into the alpha versions, I looked into the beta versions, I wrote lots of bug reports. The way how the organization dealt with my bug reports has gone worse and worse and worse over time. So much that I stopped doing it. And if the same frustration is there with people who want to bring new ideas into Java, then I can understand that they want to do it without Oracle. And I think there we see one of the problems of Java that is not really community driven. For me, Intel or SAP or Oracle are not community. These are corporates with their own agendas and their agendas are driven by commercials. Their own, very own commercials. Which of course is okay for a corporate. But the question is, is this what you want as the pure factor of driving the evolution of a programming language? Or do you want something where people independent of the existing assets of one or two organizations think about the entire community, ideally the entire world, what would be the best thing for the future? These are not the same questions and therefore we have a problem with the Java community process and I think the problem originates from corporate ownership of programming languages. Another aspect of this is C-sharp. C-sharp and Java are almost the same language. They should have never been two different languages in the first place. And one of the driving factors of making Java better is that C-sharp actually exists. There are a lot of ideas which were implemented in Java that came first in C-sharp. Why did C sharp and why was C sharp created in the first place? Does anyone know the story? When Java was released in '95, Microsoft very quickly realized that the language has a huge potential, like everyone did. The, um, that we are sitting here together is a result of the potential that Java had right from the start. So Microsoft also provided a Java virtual machine on Windows. They realized the potential that Sun was actually Sun's original motivation. Originally Sun wanted that Java is used in white and brown devices, so in washing machines and in TVs and things like that. That was the original intention. And um, but that means systems programming in a sense. Microsoft also realized the potential of Java for systems programming, but Microsoft also realized the gaps in order to do systems programming. For example, Java doesn't support structures, where you have physical control of the memory layout. But when you do systems programming, that is something you need. So Microsoft started making changes to Java extensions to fill the gap. Which means they created a version of Java, they called it J++, which was incompatible with Java. And as a consequence of that, Sun has sued Microsoft for violating the license conditions of Java. And the copyright of Java, and the trademark, and everything. Microsoft has lost the case in front of the court. As a reaction of that, they have modified J++ so much that they could no longer be sued. And the J++ that is modified so much that they can no longer be used, the language is called C-sharp and the virtual machine is called .NET. 
why do we really need both of them? Why can't we have one for all the cases of both? Just because two corporates are having two big heads and fighting with each other. I don't think that Sun and Microsoft have done the community a good service with that. The risk is that now something similar could happen to Java again. And um, a big fight is going on that jeopardizes the release of Java 9, or jeopardizes at least whether the module system is going to be part of it or not. Do you have an example to just explain the module system in other, you can say, companies or um, units, a simple one? Actually, no, because I have not worked with the other module systems. Um, I know there was criticism in the beginning because of the version numbers and things like that, but those criticisms, I think, are not justified, partially because the gaps that were addressed um, identified can be easily filled, partially because the issues have been addressed. For example, the original specification for the module version specified a format that was just digit dot digit. And that's just not how we, ver we version these days. Yeah? These days, the standard is semantic version, which means you have three version numbers, two dots, and optionally a dash with some additional version information, and then optionally again a dash and a build number. So, but that's now possible. So that's been addressed. Um, what the others do in detail, for example, I've never worked with OSGI. I know it exists, I have never worked with it. So I cannot judge it from that perspective. But um, there are blog articles where they describe why they don't like it. Um, what I've seen by reading these blog articles, that some of the criticism was unjustified, and some of the criticism has already been addressed meanwhile. I have not yet had the time to boil down which of the many criticism is actually justified. What's certainly the case is that investment that these companies have done <coughs> might be lost. No questions? Okay, let's go to the next topics. We have some updates on the process API, finally. Finally, you can access the process idea of a process, and finally, you can get handles of other processes than your own or the one you have started. Finally, you could, in theory, implement stuff like a PS and so on and kill in Java, which is very important if you develop software, for example, like Jenkins, and you want to make it portable. The, currently, what Jenkins has to do in order to be portable and control the processes that were started and um, kill them reliably is to know which operating system it's running on, which commands are available for process control, or which proprietary RPIs are available for process control, and use those. Which means that Jenkins as, as a system is not really portable. Jenkins has Unix-specific code in it, and it has Windows-specific code in it. The amount of operating system-specific code in software like Jenkins will be reduced with that. Then we have variable handles. Var handle is a new class, which is similar to the field class from Reflectum. So, so the way how you get an instance of var handle is similar to how you get an instance of field. And what it actually is, is very similar to a field in reflection. It is an object that encapsulates or represents the reference to a variable. Whether you call it reference or handle, doesn't really matter at all. But how is a var handle different from a normal field in reflection? The purpose is different. The purpose is to address a few things in concurrent programming. Currently, if you want to use a class concurrently, and if you want to use its fields concurrently, the class has to be prepared itself to 
to work in a concurrent programming model. By the class itself declaring fields already with the types prepared for concurrent programming, like for example atomic integer. What if in your scenario you're working with a class that you want to use in a concurrent scenario, but the class has never been prepared for that? And you have no chance currently. That's addressed by my handle. And my handle knows about the memory model of Java. It knows about the optimizations that are done by the Java compiler and the just-in-time compiler. For example, the Java compiler and the just-in-time compiler, they can reorder write operations to the memory. And a mechanism that prevents reordering is called fence. And bar handle allows you to deal with those fences. It also has operations which, if you know assembler, um, represent whatever assembler or machine instructions some CPUs offer in order to address concurrency on the level of the CPU itself. When the CPU is not the only CPU and multiple CPUs access the same memory. Yeah, you have instructions like check and set or test and set in machine programming, which um, operate the bus in special ways and in order to make those instructions available for high performance computing in Java, also the bar handle um, has been created. And you have um, all those methods which boil down to specific memory semantics, which very often boil down to very specific machine instructions that the normal bytecode would not be accessible. Now we have an update to try with resources. In Java 7 and Java 8, if you already had a variable from somewhere, and that is your resource that you want to close automatically with a try with resources block, you had to copy the variable in a new variable because the syntax of the try required you to make a separate declaration. In Java 9, you can directly use the variable. The only requirement is that this variable is final or at least implicitly final, which means it's never assigned again. <coughs> implicitly final means your variable, your code will still compile if you explicitly put final on the declaration. That's a nice update. Then we have updates to the diamond operator. There were special situations, for example, around anonymous classes where the use of the diamond operator would not work as expected because the type inference was only defined for types which are more specific than an interface or which are a class with a name. So now the diamond operator works in more situations than before. And the properties files have changed. That's one of the few cases where actually a breaking change is introduced. In the old versions of Java, properties files were declared to be ISO 88591, which I think was a mistake right from the start, because UTF-8 already existed in 1995, and Java was designed to be a Unicode-friendly language, and then the properties files, you had to put escape sequences in order to use Unicode characters. That's finally no longer the case. You no longer need third-party libraries or <coughs> conversion mechanisms to translate between UTF-8 and ISO 88591 in properties files. Now they are just UTF-8 files. And finally, lots of Unicode 8 support was added. Unicode 8 um, contains lots of new emojis, new characters for Chinese, um, one of the characters added is actually an ancient um, Telugu character, so also the Indian scripts were updated. Um, and whenever an update to Unicode is made, the classes like character and string need to be changed.
because they define character ranges like what is a valid character, what is a special character, and so on. So that all was updated to Unicode 8. Then we can have a small lookout on Java 10. Because that's interesting to know. The underscore is has been a valid symbol name ever since. You could just declare a variable name, and the variable name was a single underscore. Since Java 8, that's deprecated. Since Java 9, this is an error. And the reason is in Java 10 the wildcard is planned to be used for unused number parameters. The planned language update and the preparation is to first deprecate it and then make it an error and then introduce the new feature. It's one of the things I wanted to tell you. So we are at the end of the main talk now. Any questions on it? Yeah? Does Java 8 the backwards compatibility? Can I run Java 8 compatibility? Yes. The traditional backwards compatibility that you are used to, like you can, you can still run Java 1 class files with a Java 8 version machine, it's still there. You can run Java 1 to 8 class files on a Java 9 version machine. Backwards compatibility is there. Any other questions? You answered that question I we used NM. Enum. Yes, the Enum question. So the background why I use an Enum in that case comes from set theory. Because what you specify in a language like Java with your types is you actually specify descriptions of sets. Sets of objects. And um, when we look at the source code of that class, ignore for a moment that this class is an enum. But this class, regarding what it contains, has a special name in the Java community. How you call such a class? You call it a utility class. Why do we call it a utility class? That's the name that we've just chosen how we call classes that contain only static methods. If your class contains only static methods, does it make sense to create an instance of that class? It doesn't make any sense. The object wouldn't have any fields. The objects wouldn't have states. Why would you then have two different objects? They would, no matter what, always emit exactly the same behavior. So what you, before Java 5, would have usually done is you would have prevented the construction of an, of, of an instance of this class by creating a constructor with a default signature but making the constructor private. Why do we do that? Because we don't want objects. We want that this class has always zero objects. When you look at a normal class, what you describe in set theory is a mutable, dynamic, infinite set of objects. It's mutable because at any time you can create, and also dynamic, at any time you can create a new object by just calling the constructor. And also objects can disappear by being unreferenced and collected away by the garbage collector. So it's mutable at runtime and dynamic, and it's infinite because apart from memory, there's no limitation about how many objects you could create from a class. When you look at a utility class and also a singleton, the situation is very different. You want, in the case of a utility class, zero objects. So the set you want to describe is the empty set. The set shall be immutable, shall not be dynamic, and it's finite. Zero is very finite. And what mechanism is provided by the Java language in order to describe 
an immutable, predefined, finite set of objects that is an Eno. And in this case, it's describing the empty set, so I'm having an Eno with zero constants, with zero predefined objects. That's the academic reason, you could say. But there's also a pragmatic reason behind it, which is code coverage. I personally like to have 100% code coverage by my tests. And it's not because I'm being dogmatic, I'm actually quite pragmatic. It's very easy to spot new gaps in coverage if your coverage changes from 100% to something else. But it's very difficult to spot new gaps in coverage if your coverage already was just 88%. How do you see where are the new gaps? Difficult to spot. If your coverage was 100% and it drops, you know the new code that is not covered is the new gap. There is no doubt about that. And if you write a utility class, the traditional way, the private constructor, you have created code that is unreachable by coverage. So your coverage cannot be 100%. If you use an enum and you test that method, the coverage is 100%. That's the pragmatic reason why I use enums. That's actually how I found it. I had the problem with a utility class and posted a stack overflow question about how do I deal with the coverage in the IntelliJ IDEA if I have a utility class? How do I make it 100%? What's the best way? I don't want to write code with reflection to call the private constructor just to create coverage because that's, done. that's then being dogmatic and that's not useful. So I wanted to have a better answer to my question and someone came up with that you should actually use a enum. It's going to help you with coverage, but actually, from set theory, it's also the right thing. Yeah, I think that for singleton as well, it is much safer to use enums. Exactly. Because you will not get concurrency issues there or serialization issues. Exactly. So, let's say, maybe I have something similar to the hello, but I cannot use a static method because I'm implementing an interface. Now let's say, I want to do the same thing, hello world, but I want to do it with a run method coming from run and And I want a singleton for that. Then it could look like this. Of course you would not be in a, a name a class singleton normally, because uh, that it's a singleton should probably not be known to the user. Because maybe in future with design changes it will no longer be a singleton, so that knowledge should probably be hidden from the user. It would already be exposed enough by the fact how you access it. That's how you can use an enum to create a singleton. Because a singleton is a class which specifies a predefined set, and the set is the singleton set, so a set with just one element. That's exactly what I've specified with the enum. Should we want to change that class to the enum? Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Thank you very much for noticing it and pointing it out. It has to be an enum. That's what we're talking about. Does this answer your question about the why I use an enum? Yeah. And um, I want to point out on, or, or again emphasize something that Prashan said about singletons. The initialization, um, this initialization code is thread safe. You don't need to do anything to make sure that if two classes in two different threads want to get access to the singleton at the same time for the first time in the system and you want the lazily initialized singleton that you have a concurrency issue. Don't get the concurrency issue there. Because what people used to do if they want to use singletons, let's 
let's play this through for a moment. So make, let's make this a single term that's lazily initialized. So what do I have to do in order to make this a singleton? A single threaded singleton, I have to assign a field instance. And of course I have to do it only once, so if instance equals null, instance equals new. Hello singleton, and then return instance. That singleton code is not thread safe. If two threads enter the code at the same time, they might execute the statement instance equals new hello singleton twice. They might work on different singletons and you have two instances. So you don't have a singleton. You have no guarantee of having a real singleton with this code if your code is multi-threaded. And your code probably should be multi-threaded because Moore's law has changed to multi-core. So, you need to do something else. What do you need to do? <coughs> Synchronized. So, what's the problem with that code? Slow. Because whenever you want it, you use a monitor and block the other thread. You only have to block the other thread in the situation that the singleton doesn't exist yet. But if you put the if outside, it's also wrong. So what people used to do is people used um, to use double check blocking to solve that problem. That is double check blocking. So you check if the instance is null, and then you synchronize, and then you have to check again. This now works, but it did not work in the past. Because people use double check blocking so often, and actually, originally, it didn't work, it only seemed to work, but it was not the correct code. The designers of Java have said, we've, we changed the specification and the way how we deal with bytecode in order to make sure that this piece of code works. Why would this piece of code not work? All the optimizations of Java can lead to a situation where you would still get two objects in very specific cases, how the bytecodes of two different threads interleave. If you're still working on Java 7, because it was fixed in Java 8, and you need a thread safe way to initialize a singleton, and for whatever reason you don't want to use an enum, because the enum also has a cost. The enum makes a real singleton. If you want a singleton that's a real singleton in production, but not a singleton in testing, and that's what I usually recommend if your singleton has state. My other recommendation actually is don't do singletons at all. Um, the, then the correct code to do a singleton is quite surprising and quite surprisingly different.
that's the code that you should actually use until Java 7 to implement the thread safe singleton. You just use the fact how classes are loaded and that the class loader knows how to be thread safe. So when you never call this method, this class will never be used, therefore this class is not loaded. So the, this code that creates the singleton is not initialized, so your singleton is basically initialized. But if you call this method, the class loader will make sure that this class is loaded, and the class loader knows how to make sure that this class is not accidentally loaded twice or initialized twice. And then, the first time you run this, this class is loaded, the instance is created, that's how it works. So now we've not only covered why you use the like e other one, yeah. it's e one the enum one is also, uh, if, if you do a serializable, I don't think you will end up with two, two instances. Oh yes, that's a good point. If I have a serializable singleton, I can still cheat in this example. Because if I serialize it and then I load it from disk or wherever my store is, I still end up with two different instances. In the case of the enum, I only end up with one. Good point, thank you. So now you've not only seen why I used an enum in this case, but in general why an enum is useful. Enum actually is a totally underused feature in Java. Most people think of enums as just um, a list of primitive constants, because that was enums in C. But what an enum actually is, it's a class for which the set of instances is predefined. That's how you actually should think of an enum. Okay, any other questions? Then, yeah? Uh, so back to the modules part. So if I, if I want to, uh, like, do the existing code, like create a mod module out of it, like say suppose we have service and down there, I want to restrict the down there. So do I have to move that code to a specific folder structure or can I just create a module? Um, you need a folder structure for the modules. If in the same source directory, you would have multiple modules. I think the way how the command line options work, you will not need a new module structure if you have the typical straightforward use case of like a module structure from Maven, because basically you would then map every Maven module to one jigsaw module. And then you already have a separate source folder, in that case just source main instead of source module main, for your separate module. So, um, but how it really plays out, I think we have to wait for the Maven update that will bring Jigsaw support. Once we have that Maven update that brings Jigsaw support, we will also have the Gradle update, more or less automatically, because Gradle is just a wrapper on the Maven library. And um, then we will know how it plays out. Because um, I use makefiles for that, and I'm completely fine and happy with makefiles in my Java project, but I think I'm a minority in that case. And I don't, wouldn't, want, uh, would, wouldn't recommend makefiles to be used for Java projects to other people. Because you need to know make very, very well in order to successfully use make in a Java project. Other questions? Okay, then I hope you liked the talk. I hope you learned something. And have a good weekend.
I hope I'm not mistaken, we have snacks, haven't we? Do you have snacks? Yes, there are snacks. There are snacks. Yes. 